Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, so today it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Ulkan Kunik, who is a PhD student in the ACT Lab with uh, Nora Ionian. And he's also one of the smartest students that I have worked with. So it's great to have him here. He went ahead and you know put together AI techniques and uh, robotics in the, in the robotics domain. So today he will tell us about scalable tasks in motion planning for multi-robot systems in Oxford. Thank you very much, Satish, for the introduction. Um, I'm very honored to be here on this side of the room. Um, that's great. And I thought because most of you have a general AI background, I should spend maybe a minute or so to talk about what robotics is before we go into the technical details of my talk. And so in robotics, what we typically have, we have a robot. And the robot uh, senses something, so it has to reason on what to do. And then it actually does that uh, by uh, in forms of actuation. And typically in the loop, there's some environment as well. And that environment makes robotics really, really tricky because it's typically continuous. It is dynamic to the point that we can't really predict what is going on. Um, and our sensing is not good enough to really fully observe it. Um, so we can maybe partially observe it, but there will be some measurement. So from an AI perspective, you could say, well, if we ignore the continuous portion, then we could frame it as uh, a POM DB. Um, but then we are in the, in the domain of intractable problems uh, for uh, kind of practical purposes. And it turns out that robotics is hard in reality uh, as well. Um, so 2015, so just about three years ago, there was a big DARPA challenge uh, where all the top universities participated trying to work in a search and rescue scenario that a human could finish uh, in like five minutes. And here's how it looks like. Um, so of course, uh, some things work. So that example uh, has mainly bad examples, but the scenario was that a robot had to go into a cluttered environment, um, like turn a valve, walk over some rubble, a <laughs> the um, and it turns out <laughs> that it's pretty difficult to even keep that in mind when, when you, I show you other robotics videos from our group. Um, all right. So that much about generic robotics. So let me talk about my topic and what I'm personally motivated by. Um, so I like applications where multiple robots form. And that is, for example, in search and rescue, like after an earthquake, um, to, to find survivors uh, for mining applications or for warehouse applications. And in all of those three cases, it is actually very important that you have many robots to work together. For example, in search and rescue scenarios, um, you really need to find the survivors really, very quickly. Or for warehouses and mining, it is important for um, kind of being efficient that you have many robots. Um, no matter what your actual task is that you want to do, there's like this very low level primitive that you will need, which is task and motion plan. How do you get the robots from A to B? Um, and that will be kind of a foundation of it. And then finally, in all of those cases, we have lots of obstacles. Now sometimes, like in the warehouses, we will know the obstacles up front. But in a search and rescue scenario, that is certainly not the case. We might have some initial guess how it will look like, uh, but we don't really know uh, once we get in what it really will be. Um, and so, of course, that kind of multi-robot or multi-agent task in motion planning has been addressed in the past. And so maybe the most famous one is like the sliding puzzle, um, which has been solved very successfully in AI. Um, and also in robotics, people have been using uh, multiple uh, robots. Um, and so the difference here is that uh, in AI, we have lots of guarantees but it's actually difficult to apply it directly to robots, and I will explain in a little bit why that is. Um, so the goal for this talk today is that we solve this 
a task and motion planning problem that, sh that it will work on real robots. Um, and we will base the solution on top of AI solvers, uh, combine it with some quad specific post processing step um, and some execution framework to actually make it work uh, even in dynamically. And I will structure the talk in kind of four major topics. The first, I want to give you an overview on what has been done so far in AI and robotics. Uh, then I will give you a solution that uh, I have developed for ground robots and for aerial vehicles. And finally, I will finish up on. All right, so let's first start looking at the state of the art for task and motion. And let's start with AI that is uh, a little bit older even. Um, and so one of the um, kind of most famous or most common approaches is what is called multi-agent path finding or map app. And in this case, we are given a map of the environment and start and goal position. And in the label case, uh, those are assigned. So we have on the left-hand side, a green robot and a purple robot. And then on the right-hand side, uh, we have the goal assignment of purple and green uh, rectangle. And the goal is uh, to find a collision-free path uh, such that we minimize some objectives, and the typical objectives are uh, the sum of cost of movement primitives or the make span, which is uh, the last, the time until the last robot reaches. And on this case, you can kind of see that uh, they have to swap sides, so the purple robot has to move into the alcove temporarily, uh, no matter what we do. And so this would be uh, an optimal uh, solution for this. Now you can create different variants. Uh, for example, unlabeled variant, uh, we have uh, a set of goal locations, set of start locations, and we can also uh, change the assignment. Uh, so in this case, robots could just move in a straight line. Um, or we can define the k-color case, where we basically have two or more different groups of robots, and you can imagine they might have different capabilities, and we can interchange robots uh, between uh, within a group, but not between. Uh, so here we have green group and the purple group, and we can uh, we need to find a plan and a task assignment at the target uh, configuration uh, at the bottom. Um, now, in the AI community, people have uh, found very interesting theoretical results. So it turns out that the labeled case is actually uh, NP-hot to minimize for sum of cost and make span. And for make span, uh, we also know it's actually even NP-hot to approximate uh, this a factor less than four thirds. Um, then surprisingly, the unlabeled case can actually be solved uh, in polynomial time. Uh, yes. So what is uh factor less than four thirds. Uh, so if you want, uh, so basically if you, the optimal solution would be factor one, four thirds mean if you want a solution with bounded suboptimal factor less than four thirds, then we cannot get it. Um, all right, so surprisingly the unlabeled case, and, and so feel free to interrupt me. But to, um, so surprisingly, in the unlabeled case, we can actually solve that in polynomial time. And the proof is constructive, so you can actually come up with an algorithm that is based on uh, uh, flow-based techniques. And in the k-colored case, uh, if k is at least two, obviously, then we also know that it's NP-hot uh, it and to approximate that case as well. Now, the hardness results are a little bit uh, annoying. So but of course, people have tried solving it anyway. <laughs> and uh, there are many different solutions. So the first most obvious solution is uh, reduction based. So let's just say uh, we look at the joint space, we combine all the robots into like one big robot, and then we can run a stop. Or we can reduce it to other solutions that are, of course, also empty hard, but where we might have good solvers, such as integer linear programming or a satisfying bit. Um, another method is search-based. Here the idea is to try to 
kind of keeps the agents or robots separate as much as possible and only couple them uh, once it's actually needed. From the install framework uh, and the config based search framework, that idea is basically the same, but uh, the way the uh, conflicts are resolved are, are very different. So I have some kind of different um, kind of qualities of the solution. And then finally, there's also kind of what I call rule based methods that where somebody really swap came up with a good set of rules and then uh, at the end proved some properties on top of it. And so the reduction based method, as you might imagine, uh, is complete and optimal. So that's great news for us. The search based method, we can also show that it's complete and uh, we can do it optimally. But the nice thing is that we can also leverage. Uh, some other results uh, in uh, the search community and come actually up with a, bound, uh, a uh, bounded suboptimal. And that is uh, the same. The uh, W is user provided. So we can say we want a solution factor of 1.5, and then we get uh, that solution uh, typically much quicker than an optimal. And then the rule based methods, uh, you can luckily show it's complete, but it's suboptimal. And there's no good way of kind of bounding out how good it is. Uh, what about uh, probabilistic algorithms like Monte Carlo or, or just these methods? Do um, you address these types of what, yes, uh, I will actually of, okay. come to that as well. Um, so, yes. so I thought that the push and rotate algorithm was complete only on trees, not in general graphs, is the math. But, I think swap and rotate was the one, might be mistaken. Like one of the, the first paper was certainly not the push and swap, you mean? Yes, push and swap. Um, yeah, some, some of them, you might be right that they might, be, they might not be able to deal with all cases. There are sometimes certain assumptions that you need a certain number of free vertices. I think push and rotate needs at least two plus three vertices. Um, all right, and so that's basically the, like a quick glance on what the AI community has been done. And robotics has worked uh, as well on the topic. Um, and so one obvious way of doing it would be, let's just take the AI solution and apply it to a robot, right? And when I talk about robots, that includes all kinds of different robots, so you can have those kind of warehouse robots that carry heavy goods. Uh, in the middle picture, we have the drilling robots that are really, really heavy. So, uh, or you could have very small, agile uh, robots. And the problem with ro robots are that they're subject to what's called kinodynamic constraints. Your kinematic constraints uh, refers to something geometric, uh, such that uh, joint limits or obstacles in the space, robots have a physical example. And dynamic constraints refer uh, to a temporal constraint. So for example, robots can only reach a certain maximum velocity or acceleration or even higher or order derivative. And unfortunately, they are covered. So if you drive a car around, you can take really tight turns if you slow down, but not if you're going fast. And so in robotics, we really need to address that. And the people have also looked at kind of from a theoretical standpoint, how complicated it is. And it turns out that even if you look at a very simple 2D case and like a polygonal environment and disk-like robots that just have to move around, but just a decision problem if you can move them from A to B, these ways off. Uh, and that is even true in the unlabeled case that for the discrete settings that we just discussed was actually polynomial. So that's a shocking result, but again, people did not give up on it and try to solve it. And uh, there are a bunch of different solutions and they were mostly created separately from the AI community, uh, but there are certain similarities here. And so the first idea people had was we look at it as a meta, ro meta robot. So we combine all the robots together and then we just plan as a joystick, similar to the reduction based approach in AI. Um, and you can do that with search based methods or with optimization based methods, uh, such, as, such as MIQP. 
Um, the second idea was to decouple the robot somehow. And so there are different kinds of decoupling methods. One is you just plan one robot after another and treat the previous robot as dynamic obstacles. The other one would be if you just look at as a geometric uh, problem first and then figure out some temporal execution later on. And that is similar to the search based methods in AI. Uh, and then finally, uh, or not finally, finally, but uh, finally compared to AI, we have collision avoidance methods, which is something which is similar to rule based. Somebody comes up with a really good algorithm and improves a theoretical property. Most famous uh, is Orca, which is used in computer games, uh, for example. Uh, and here we are, uh, and have also in the robotics community, uh, just very recently, a few years ago, a sampling-based uh, solution is uh, called discrete RT, and that one actually uh, has some, uh, is like a probability. Um, and so it turns out if you kind of compare the different methods, they have uh, different pros and cons. So the solutions in AI work in very dense environments, like puzzle-like or maze-like environments. They scale pretty well in practice, at least if you state of the art solvers. They have very nice theoretical guarantees. But it's pretty much impossible to just take a solution by two. And then on the other hand, we have the robotics community that developed really nice uh, algorithms that actually work on robots and show it on robots, but typically they are, uh, they're scaling really, really badly with the number of robots. And there are also usually no theoretical care. Um, and so now I will present our kind of first line uh, of work that we had to kind of try to combine uh, the ideas uh, for ground. Um, so here's the idea of the following. If you recall uh, that original example I gave uh, over here where the robots have to swap sides, um, then no matter what we do, robot number two always has to move independent of kind of kinodynamic constraint. The idea here is that we use the discrete planning to just figure out the ordering between the robots. And then we do some post-processing step. In this case, uh, we use simple temporal networks to bring it back to both continuous time and space. Um, and so I will kind of go through that a little bit. Um, so in the following, the robot model I assume is that we can somehow follow time waypoints so we can get a location and a time where we want to arrive, and that we can more or less move with a constant velocity. So we don't really uh, model acceleration here. Um, we tried it on robots, so that is realistic for some class of robots. Um, all right, so let's consider again this little example with our two robots. Uh, the robot one uh, basically has to move from A to B uh, to C, B and E, and robot two over here has to go from B to C, then from C to F, F to C, and then C to D. Now what we can do is we can create this temporal plan graph where we basically have on the horizontal line just at the edges, uh, the type one edges that have precedences between a single robot. So this line is for robot one, this line is for robot. Now to figure out dependencies, we need to just look at uh, similar locations. So if you look, for example, at that location, then we know that uh, robot number two has to start moving towards C first before robot one can move from A to B. And so we create what we call a type two edges, uh, which kind of cover this uh, dependency over here. And it turns out that you can just run a standard solver and then polynomial time, create such graphs, um, cover uh, or to capture kind of this uh, tendencies between the graph. Now the problem here is if you would just take that as kind of like a dependency graph for execution, as that it still doesn't know anything about the physical extent of the robots. 
Uh, so a simple example here, uh, our robot number two just moved out of B towards C. And then our robot number one actually sped up a little bit out of A towards B, and there's a collision. And so obviously we don't want that. We need to come our model uh, directly. And so what we do here is that we uh, create what we call an augmented temporal plan graph, uh, where we add additional safety uh, markers in that TPG. And the distance to the safety markers is uh, user-specified with few limitations. Uh, but it basically means that uh, if I assume that the edge length here was one meter, then I can select delta of 0 0.75 meters. And then I just have to add two additional uh, safety markers in here. And we can show theoretically that suffices uh, to uh, ensure the safety. Um, and so if you kind of play around with different safety markers, then you might get a few more edges. So principles, the smaller your delta gets, the more kind of safety uh, edges you need to add. Um, so here, for the example, uh, 0 0.25, um, you get uh, like four instead of two edges per uh, kind of edge in the original TP. Um, so once we did that, it captures all the dependencies. But what we really need is to get you that tells us which robot should arrive where and when. And so luckily, we can just take that TPG and convert it to a simple temporal network, where we encode uh, kind of the edge length uh, of the graph and the velocity bound on that edge or for that specific robot as a kind of edge annotation. Um, so in this particular example, uh, the annotation is uh, given as the numbers, and you can read it as the first number being roughly the minimum time to traverse that a particular edge, and the upper limit being the maximum time to traverse the edge. And so you see uh, a few uh, edges don't have a maximum time, which means that there is no minimum speed limit. And then a few edges over here that do have a maximum time and there is a minimum speed limit, which could be, for example, interesting uh, for boats or other robots uh, that cannot simply stop. Um, and so you can annotate it. You also add those kind of additional um, kind of start and goal of vertices to the graph. And then you can compute a schedule with kind of additional method of simple temporal networks, which is just building the distance graph, running band of board on it. Um, and then we basically get just the arrival time uh, assigned to each foot. That gives us time schedule that we want. Um, we also have some kind of theoretical guarantees. Um, so basically the delta, what you can specify, that gives us indeed uh, safety distance with respect to the uh, switch graph. Uh, we have polynomial runtime of the post processing. And actually, this search is actually more harder than the post processing. Um, and then also, if uh, we don't have a uh, lower speed limit, then we will find it. Uh, and it turns out it actually works pretty fast. Practice. So here's one example where we have 400 robots uh, over 91 time steps. It's quite a lot of vertices and edges, but you can solve it in a few seconds. Um, and then you can simulate it like that with different safety distances. Uh, you can all kinds of fun experiments, model a warehouse where all the robots have to cross. Um, you can do it in simulation on those kind of spider-like robots, uh, or you can actually run it on real robots. Um, here they are tasked with information change. And you uh, don't fill up. Um, all right. So that kind of was a great uh, kind of proof of concept for us to really see how we can take an AI solution is on post-processing on top of it, and then get it to work on here.
And then we were thinking about what about other vehicles? And so the second uh, part I want to discuss today, what do we do if we have blind vehicles? And so here the uh, kind of problem is that we still have a map of the environment. Now, unfortunately, it's 3D and not 2D. Uh, we have start and goal locations. Uh, so the start locations are on the left circle and the goal locations uh, are on the right, so lighter colors. And what we want is uh, a kind of a smooth trajectory for each robot and potentially also goal assignment because all of our robots are more or less like um, and so the additional challenges here compared to the ground robot case is that we are now really in kind of this 3D domain and we are both in continuous uh, time and space. In the previous case, we were still following kind of the kind of the free path. Now we really want those to check. Um, for our aerial vehicles, we cannot make uh, the assumption that we can more accelerations. Uh, in fact, you need to go uh, up to what's called snap, which is uh, the fourth derivative. Um, and we kind of have different objectives uh, because every time we fly, we hover, we use a lot of energy. So typically you want to minimize uh, your energy usage uh, at the end. And then there's something which uh, is pretty annoying in terms of planning, which uh, is called the downwash effect. If you have uh, two robots like that, they can fly very close to each other in the horizontal. Uh, but if they fly on top of each other, you need a very large vertical safety. Um, and that is just because of our aerodynamic impacts. Uh, and so just modeling a robot as a steel, for example, doesn't make sense in this case and would lead to collision. So what we do instead is we model our robots as axis aligned and its side. And you can actually, um, or there's literature about that where people try to measure it and it shows that this is more or less accurate model. Um, and the rest of the approach is more or less similar to before. So we have two phases. Phase number one uh, works in discrete space and it's basically a graph based planning approach. And phase number two is a post processing step, in this case, an optimization. Step. And so I will go through that slowly, but maybe to give you an example, uh, down here uh, we have on the left hand side two robots that are tasked to crop size. Uh, we can then uh, generate a roadmap like that. We can do uh, some kind of conflict annotation, which I will explain later. But at the end, we hopefully get a discrete solution which tells us how we could swap sides without colliding. And technically, we could execute that solution, but at every vertex, we would need to stop, unfortunately. Uh, and so finally, in the post-processing step, we kind of smooth it out to be able to execute it without stop. All right. So the first problem is, how do we actually generate good roadmaps? Uh, because what we, what we have is a continuous space, and what we need is some reasonable and reasonable here means it should be connected. Uh, as a shortest path it should, in continuous domain, should roughly reflect the shortest path in the domain. Uh, and we also want it to be false uh, at the end, so as few vertices and edges as possible for computational efficiency. Um, and so, luckily, there's an algorithm that kind of works okay. Uh, which is called SPARS. Uh, so the idea here is that first generate a roadmap using a probabilistic method, uh, that is Artix, uh, also known as ERM. And then we use from graph theory, a so-called graph spanners, which basically just pick out the edges and vertices that are most useful um, for the roadmap. Uh, and so we kind of only keep those. And you can specify roughly what kind of edge length uh, you want on average. Now, once you created the graph, you can kind of see that on the top is like a grid uh, like graph, and on the bottom is a graph generated by sparse, and so you get edges all around. And so the problem here is now is that it's not guaranteed anymore that if you have two robots 
uh, that there will be collision. So consider this example over here. We have one robot is at the vertex over here, and another robot is somehow traversing. Then there's one configuration, which is one over here, where there would be a collision with respect to our ellipsoid model. Um, and so we need to kind of find those collisions, both for vertex edge, vertex vertex, and edge edge. And what we do is we just uh, compute the, uh, we do a pairwise collision checking uh, on the roadmap, which can be done offline, basically as a pre-processing step of, of the roadmap, and then for other uh, kind of start and goal um, assignments, uh, you can reuse it. Good, that's online. Uh, yes, I will have some numbers. Uh, it actually takes quite a long time. To, uh, it's still polynomial, um, but in practice, a uh, collision checking is always expensive. Um, and then we took uh, some of the ideas uh, from the uh, kind of AI community for that app, extended it to include this vertex vertex, edge edge, and vertex edge conflict. Uh, so here our uh, multi agent pathfinding with generalized conflicts now takes a roadmap uh, in, it takes also the, those conflict sets uh, as input. And the start and goal vertices. And then, as before, it's supposed to output a path for each robot such that all of those conflict sets are, are basically not viable. Um, and we showed that this is NP hard. And unfortunately, even in the unlabeled case, which you might remember was the one case that was actually uh, in the original map platform. And we also developed several solvers that are extensions of existing MATLAB solvers and kind of use their good ideas. Uh, one is, is an extension of enhanced conflict based search, uh, which turns out to work really, really well in practice. Uh, and another version is uh, just an ILP formulation, um, which does not look that well in practice. So, we have it. And so if you do that and you compute a schedule, then for our initial example, you get something like that. Uh, so it looks totally crazy to me. I would not want a robot to execute that, but you could. If you would stop at every single vertex, you could actually execute that thing. So the big question is now, how do we actually get from this very weird looking graph to something that, that looks like that we do this trajectory optimization. Now, the first part of trajectory optimization is what we call spatial partitioning. And so here, consider three robots, the red, green, and blue robot, uh, and four time steps. And so if you look at the first time step, then all the three robots are basically tasked to kind of move on this line segment in the discrete sequence. What we can do is we can compute separating hyperplanes uh, between those robots, so we now just consider the green robot and the shaded area basically for this time step shows us um, a spatial partition or a hyperspace where we can safely. We can repeat that for time two, time three, and time four. And now if you do that in 3D, you get a kind of polyhedra that are somehow connected. And so in this case, you see uh, the original discrete plan as the black line, and then the red highlighted portion is just one time step, and the polyhedra um, is just um, also marked in red. And so that uh, looks scary, but then you can see that you can find a smooth curve just inside the uh, connected polyhedra. And so the way we find that smooth curve is making use of a nice mathematical property of uh, Bezier curves, um, which basically states that if you have a Bezier curve uh, and you put all, then the curve itself, the lie, and the convex hull of all the curves. In this animation, you can see as a convex hull, we can move the control points around, but the curve will always be in that convex hull. Um, and so all we need to make sure is that uh, whenever we decide where the control points are, as long as they are in the convex hull, then the curve will be used. 
And so the nice thing is that this formulation actually allows us to formulate that as a quadratic program, which can be fairly efficiently solved in practice. And we try to minimize energy, um, which for quad motors uh, is defined uh, fairly easily as a quadratic objective. Um, and we just put additional constraints to make sure that if we have multiple phase groups, that they're smooth at the connection point. Uh, um, and that they lie in the respect. And you only have to do, you can formulate one QP per robot, so you can that was um, optimistic. And then, so if you do that, uh, then the first round, you might do it, get something like that, so it's smooth, but if the discrete planner decided to kind of do something strange because he used some suboptimality bounds, and you still have like the strange loop. And so what you can do is you just repeat the procedure. You create new spatial corridors around the first uh, created uh, trajectory. And then you uh, optimize again, try to minimize energy. And it turns out after a few iterations, you get something that looks really great even to the human eye. And you can even quantify that advantage by just looking at how the maximum acceleration or angular velocities uh, change over time while you uh, iterate over it, and you see after a few iterations, it's usually stable. Um, and then you can take that and you can animate uh, the whole procedure, and you get something really nice like that. And so that, by the way, uh, we did in about two minutes, where nearly one minute was just spent on generating the roadmap, probabilistic, still a fairly simple process. Um, we did a few other examples that I will skip, um, but I won't skip this one because that's the fun part. But we also tried uh, to execute the whole procedure on quad rotors, although the quad rotors are pretty small, about the palm of my hand. Um, we have 32 of them. Um, we uh, just put up random obstacles and, um, uh, and then upload the trajectories uh, and let them execute it. And we were in particular interested if the downwash uh, would be problematic, but indeed our solver found solutions <laughs> to the downwash problem. <laughs> Um, all right, so that gives us a great solution for uh, a kind of a homogeneous team of robots, where all the robots are. Now, the big question is, can we actually do something about heterogeneous teams of robots? And so here we have four types of robots, kind of the really small one we used before was 33 grams. Uh, yeah. Sorry, before we go into this topic, I have... Couple of questions. Maybe that sounds silly, but uh, sure. Sure with me. Uh, first, uh, you are assuming that the whole environment is a static; it's not changing, right? In this world, yes. Uh, and uh, second, have you ever tried to add some noise to the system to see whether you, your model still converges to the optimal point or not? Uh, because uh, as far as I... we get tons of noise because we cannot execute trajectory. Uh, yes, but even the map of the environment is ideal in the model, right? Correct. Um, Basically, if that assumption is violated, you might plan a trajectory that actually goes through an obstacle, and then it would crash in that case. Uh, and uh, have you tried to analyze uh, formally whether actually it converges to the ideal path? No. Okay. So we don't have end-to-end -end guarantees in this one. Right? So we basically, it's a two-stage process where we optimize something in the discrete stage and we optimize kind of something else in the continuous stage. And so if you do this kind of decoupling, I'm sure you can find an example where you don't have end-to-end. -end. If you want end-to-end -end guarantees, there are other optimization-only methods that work, but that don't scale. All right, any other questions? All right, uh, so we had 
uh, four different types of robots, uh, really tiny ones, uh, and then we kind of build uh, two larger platforms of quadrotors, uh, and we also use a fun uh, ground robot. Um, and so that creates additional challenges. Number one is they can all move at kind of different dynamic limits per robot type. No? And number two is it turns out that the spatial constraints between the robots are even more difficult now because a small robot can fly uh, very close on top of a big one, but not the other way around, but certainly asymmetric. And so it turns out that by a very small change, actually, you can still leverage complete framework. So what we do here is we create roadmaps now uh, for each type of uh, the robots. And so, for example, if you have a large and fast robots, and right hand side, you get uh, a roadmap with kind of longer edges to reflect that it can uh, uh, a longer distance and more time step. And then for small and slow robots, you get kind of a more densely populated. And then you can kind of join the roadmaps together and you can basically reuse everything else. Um, just because of robotics, I have to show many, many videos. Um, so here we have a team of, I believe, 15 robots, uh, 10 small ones, two medium ones, one big UAV, and two ground robots. Um, and you can kind of, it's hard to tell, there will be one uh, video where you can kind of tell that they really get very close uh, to each other, which is what we want. And one of them even lands on uh, this robot. So on the big one, they put a camera, and you can kind of see that it goes very close to obstacles, but also, for example, to the ground robot, um, and that it tries to, uh, that it was kind of below the smaller one, which is fine, but not the other way around. Sorry. Does this deal with dynamic environment or just static one? That was still static. Everything static. Getting to the dynamic one. Um, all right. So that's kind of like what you've seen with us with published work. Um, and I think was received very well. It's still the state of the art for like multi robot time uh, on robot. Um, now, if we think back about the kind of three examples I brought at the beginning, uh, which was kind of the search and rescue, mining, and warehousing, then everything is dynamic, as you guys already pointed out. So basically, this kind of static planning is fun, but it's not really applicable. And that becomes even a bigger problem if you look at kind of long-term persistent operation. Everything here was kind of very short, like we fly for 30 seconds. Um, and so we somehow need to address that. And we also, if we address it, we need to find uh, like a way on how to test those systems. And so that is currently work in progress, but I will share some exciting results that we just got uh, last month with you. Um, so this is what I call safe motion execution. So here the idea is that uh, dynamic changes are mostly local. So if you have some kind of map of a warehouse, static obstacles will be around, but maybe a person will run. So if you want to avoid future collisions, what you want to do is you want to stay as close as possible to the pre-planned trajectory um, or get around. So let's look at one example over here. The planned trajectories of the two robots uh, to swap sites, and so that's collision free. But then somebody even put that robot at a different spot uh, and added an additional obstacle. And what we try to do is get here where those lines of the executed trajectory. So I think I don't have time to go into the exact details on how it works, but it's surprisingly just an extension of the work we just discussed. And here's how it looks. Um, so we did it in 2D only so far, and we had uh, six ground robots, and that is kind of just a normal execution where we just execute the plans perfectly using our existing plan. And then here, one robot over here 
you just turn it off in the middle and it breaks down. And the other ones dynamically move around. Uh, here we add this black obstacle and the, you know, the ones that went through that area had to be planned. Uh, here we changed additionally initial, again, some of the robots had to react. Uh, and here, uh, somebody just <laughs> moves the robot around. And again, uh, we can work on that. And just this example again, um, kind of see how it works. It's uh, the approach itself uh, uses a combination of discrete search, obviously, uh, and continuous optimization, but we do it in a distributed and real time fashion. So everything you see run on the robots is like, very low end computers in real time. Um, and that's the best competition so far. Uh, that's the state of the art. <clears throat> I think there will be maybe a video of our solution just in a second. Um, so the state of the art is basically works very well if you don't have obstacles, really bad if you have obstacles. And then our solution I'll shoot. Now, as it creates those really beautiful smooth trajectories, um, the kind of lines you see is mainly for us for debugging purposes, um, but the kind of sees that it gets very nice. Um, all right, so to kind of summarize the work, um, so I discussed micro robot task and motion planning, and that it can be decoupled in a discrete stage and a continuous stage. Um, and the advantage if you do that is that you basically combine the advantages of AI-based solutions and robotic solutions. That's high scalability, get some theoretical guarantees, although they're not as strong as before. And we have shown that it works on different kinds of work. The downside is that this kind of post-processing steps that I use is kind of robot dependent, where you need to do different things for different kinds of work. And I think more generally, uh, if you look at AI, the book also shows that it is certainly possible to solve uh, continuous problems by first working in combinatorical optimization and then doing some post process. It's not only a thing people do in the lot. Right. And so with that, I would like to thank all my collaborators. Uh, so my advisor, Nora Yanyan, and of course Satish uh, played a very crucial role uh, in all of the work I presented today. Uh, and I also collaborated uh, with Sven Koenig uh, and Gaurav Sukhan. Um, and find uh, papers and videos and all of that on our webpage, and I'm available for any more questions. Thank you. So we have quite some time actually for questions. So, uh, good question. Have you tried like reinforcement learning? No. So I think generally speaking, the, the idea is AI guys are very good on the combinatorial side. You want to take a problem like this and uh, sort of do the heavy lifting of the combinatorics using AI technology. And then you want to put in the rest of the issues, kinematic constraints and so forth. That, that strategy in general is what gives us scalability. That, that's sort of the concept. So maybe to add on to this, uh, if you look at uh, self-driving cars, for example, where reinforcement learning had quite some uh, The problem people have is that it works very well in many cases, but once it doesn't work, there's basically no insight on why it doesn't work. Right? You basically, you take an additional example, you retrain, and that fixes the problem. Right? And so I think the motivation here of kind of doing this more traditional AI approach is really said. Uh, when it comes to collisions, we really want safety clarity. Um, so, so you it sounds like you have two kind of boundary conditions for each uh, of the ellipsoid um, when you're validating the discrete path. Then um, you iterate with the 
hyper points. Um, I was wondering, is, is there kind of a way to do that all in one step to uh, potentially warp the ellipsoid so that you can kind of do a, um, you know, the hyperplane's just a couple of steps out. I'm sure if I understand the question. So you're, you're right with the iteration. Uh, and I think one reason why we kind of use a hyperplane computation and then the optimization is that it allows us to use QP. So other people have uh, tried to not use a kind of hyperplane uh, approximation, which basically kind of um, forms a set of uh, convex spaces, uh, but the world is not convex, and tried in, uh, instead to kind of model it as an optimization problem that is not convex. But then the issue is that it's computationally, basically. Um, what was that the question? Or? Kind of. The reason I was interested in the hyperplanes is because um, uh, video games, 90s, uh, there was a paper that came out, I'm forgetting which, I'm trying to find it, but it uh, basically suggested to use hyperplanes for collision detection in video games. Uh, basically triage when a uh, collision is probable in the next n many time steps, and then use a more rigorous uh, collision detection algorithm for those high probability collisions. And that gave a tremendous boost to it. Yeah, so from, from a collision perspective, checking perspective, I believe the current state of the art is uh, you use axis aligned uh, kind of bounding boxes that don't in, in kind of hierarchies as like a quick check, and then you do hierarchical checking. Right? Like you first use the axis aligned bounding boxes, and you do uh, a check based on like a convex hull property. And only if all of that is true, you go into the non convex collision check. We'll talk more after that. I, the, okay. I want to unpack that more. Okay. Wolfgang, I have a question. So uh, basically, I'm personally interested in sort of robots, which uh, are other things that are capable of. So uh, for, on the discrete side, it's um, the the common rhetorics would essentially be um, sort of uh, lattice based. Um, now, do you think on the continuous post processing side? there would be any new issues to deal with or pretty much the same sort of? So I believe it depends on how you define the lattice. So typically there are two, so I don't know who is aware of lattice. So lattice is the idea that you have kind of motion primitives. Like let's say you have a car and one lattice could be where you do like a 10 degree turn. And that would be your actions. So. The, most of the time, the problem with lattices is if you want to do very good planning, you need many of those motion primitives to get a high branch. And you would also technically need to include kind of the starting velocity and the final velocity to fit you. Now, if you will somehow find this at, and we can generate many, many motion primitives, and I believe you might not even do post processing, you would just use the lattice basically. So I think if we want to go ahead with that approach, the main advantage would be that we can keep the branching factor low by having kind of motion primitives that more look at uh, kind of the kinematics of geometric constraints only, and then deal with a dynamic constraint in the post process. And I believe that it will be basically so. Although uh, the exact uh, optimization technique will be different uh, because uh, this kind of planning of trajectories based on Bézier curves only works for uh, what's called a differentially flat uh, robot. And so for forklifts, I'm not entirely sure if they have the differentially flat problem. Other uh, questions? Yeah, I have one. If not, let's uh, thank the speaker once again. And you can thank him.